Hey everybody, it's Rob Hoyle here at Northwell Labs with Dr. Dwayne Brining, where Northwell is doing about 200 semi-automatic uh, automated tests a day for the coronavirus. Uh, doctor, how has this been for you and your staff here being pretty much at the center of, of coronavirus testing here in, in, in New York State? Uh, I tell you, we've been uh, running more or less nonstop for the past uh, two weeks here, trying to bring up as much testing as possible. Uh, the good news I have is we just validated yesterday one of our high throughput machines that will allow us to throw about 800 tests a day on that machine to start. So right out of the gate, that quadruples the amount of testing we could do on the manual and semi-automated platform. Now we're up to fully automated. Right, and that's great. And so as the tests go up, the numbers will go up, and, and, and it seems scary, but that's a good thing. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, since uh, there was a delay in the testing availability so that everybody who could get tested uh, or wanted to get tested couldn't get tested, now we're actually learning what the prevalence of the infection is. So don't panic as you see numbers jumping up day by day in significant leaps. I mean, certainly the virus is spreading, that's part of it, but the bigger part of it is now that more people are being tested, uh, we're gonna know how many real positives there are out there. And that's kind of a you know bad news, good news sort of situation. We'll find out that more people have the virus than we thought before, um, but the truth is it's not as uh, severe or fatal as the original numbers seem to indicate as you learn that it's much more prevalent than we thought. Right, and I guess also the good news, and, and also too, just for the people watching, we're staying six feet apart. We're, sta yeah. we're keeping our social distancing and everybody in if here If we too. get closer than that, I gotta wear this. Right, uh, so yeah. it is important to do all this, but also too, when those numbers go up and we know about it more, I guess it's good because the people who are infected or possibly infected should then stay isolated. Everybody's staying, you know. That's absolutely right. Uh, for, for some of these infections, the symptoms will be surprisingly mild. I mean, don't forget, for the vast majority of people who even get this infection, it's just going to be like the regular flu. Um, but a lot of people get a very mild infection, so they may not even think that they have the COVID-19. Um, so as more testing is available, those people find out they have it, they can self-isolate. And that's how we slow this thing down, you know, from spreading right through the population unchecked. That's great. Uh, I have a lot of questions for Dr. Brining. If you have questions, you could type them into the comment section. We'll try to answer as many as we can. We could see lab technicians working here behind us. And uh, just tell me how many, how many technicians or clinicians or, or lab people here at Northwell Labs are working on the coronavirus testing. Uh, we have approximately 30 techs uh, that usually work in the molecular laboratory here. Um, in addition, we've moved other people and we have people in the laboratory volunteering to help make that go as fast as possible. Um, so we are ramping up to testing basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, around the clock for as long as it takes uh, right. to do this testing. So as far as I know, we're semi-automated testing, which can do like, mm -hmm. uh, you said, maybe up to 800. Are we going to be it fully automated? It can do automated? up to 800, okay. but in these early phases, um, realize it's the same couple of factories that are trying to supply the entire country with reagents. Um, so we're only able to get 100 or 200 kits from them every day to test, and that's why we want to diversify the different testing platforms that we use um, so that if uh, one supplier has difficulty giving us as much as we want, we can switch to another platform and still get the amount of testing done that needs to get done. Okay, and so we're starting to see now in the news, we're seeing mobile sites where people are driving in their cars mm -hmm. and they're getting tested. Uh, who, who should be getting tested right now? Uh, right now, people who are symptomatic um, can get tested. Uh, we prioritize the testing while there's still limitations on testing to uh, the sickest people who are in the hospital can get the testing in this laboratory here where we can turn it around uh, within a day or a half a day. People who are less sick who can stay at home and isolate themselves who may have mild uh, disease, uh, they can still get tested, but they'll be in the back of the line. They go out to the national commercial labs for the most part. Testing can take up to a few days, sometimes up to a week. And while that's being going on, they should be isolated. They should stay Absolutely. Um, anybody who has any question uh, it should act as though they have the disease until they find out whether or not they have the infection. That's the best way to limit the spread of this. Um, and you can do that. You can be effective. Um, I tell people a story that uh, about a month and a half ago, I was pretty sick, spent a few days at home. I'm actually wondering whether I had the COVID-19 infection before anybody was testing for it. Um, but I was home with my family. Uh, my wife and I still shared the same room and slept in the same bed and my kids, you know, didn't completely avoid me and I just made sure I used a separate towel. I threw my own Kleenex away. 
Um, I, I didn't, uh, you know, share any uh, glasses or anything with anyone in my family. No one else in my family got sick. And the coronavirus, uh, this coronavirus, like other coronaviruses, you can take those actions and limit the spread of this. Although it seems like it's spreading rapidly, it's not some super virus that spreads by means that we don't know about. Yeah, and which brings us to uh, a question from one of our viewers. Ken wants to know, what are the ways this virus spreads? So this virus, uh, to the best of our understanding, and we do have experience with other coronaviruses, it spreads by something called droplet spread. So if I were to cough or to sneeze, the virus is suspended in vapor droplets, water droplets, and they extend about six feet before they hit the ground. And unless you touch those droplets or unless they get into your mucous membranes of your nose, your mouth, or your eye somehow, um, that's not really a risk to you. It is not something called airborne spread, which is we, we know about the measles as the example for that. If one person in a room has the measles, uh, the measles spreads by airborne spread, which means the virus stays alive and floats in the air. And if one of us has it, um, about 80% of the other people in the room would cap, catch the measles if they weren't uh, vaccinated or if they didn't have it before. This is not like that. This is like the flu. It's droplets. The droplets go out for six feet and they fall. It can live for a few hours on surfaces depending on the, uh, on the conditions in the room. So by far the most common route of spread is if somebody sneezes in their hand, touches a doorknob or something like that, and then you come along and touch it, you still haven't caught it. The, the, the virus cannot go through your skin. Skin is pretty tough stuff. But if I scratch my nose, rub my eye, touch my mouth, that's how these things are spread. So if we limit that type of behavior, we can do a really good job controlling this. So rule of thumb, when we push a doorknob or go into a bathroom or something, after we touch that doorknob, we should probably try to wash our hands that's with soap right. and water for about 20 seconds. That's right. Okay. Soap and water does a great job of, uh, of uh, killing this virus along with many others. It's actually better than the hand sanitizer. We got another question. This one's coming in from Julie. Will people with pre-existing conditions be given preference for a test? Uh, yes. Um, we do try and prioritize the testing based on how fast the testing can be turned around from the sample to the result. Um, so the people who we try and move into the front of the line are obviously the sickest patients in a hospital um, who need to get into respiratory wards and, and need ventilator support or something like that. That's our first priority. And then it sort of goes down the line all the way to the end, which are people with mild symptoms um, who don't have any other risk factors who basically could stay at home and be isolated. Okay, so uh, I'm seeing a lot of people here. There's a, there's a lot of people working here at Northwell mm -hmm. Lab. How do <coughs> these guys and gals, how do they stay safe? How are they not getting the virus? I've been telling a lot of people, you know, for the last couple of weeks that thi this laboratory and any laboratory might be the safest place to be right now. Really? Um, we're so used to working with samples. Basically, any sample that a laboratory like this deals with, whether it's a respiratory sample, a blood sample, or something else, is potentially a bioterrorism weapon. Um, and you don't know which sample and which tube is the one that might be infected with something. So we practice something called universal precautions. Um, even if we didn't have this current coronavirus situation, things would look much the same way you see them now. When we work with samples, we always mask up, gown up, make sure we don't get splashed with anything um, because most things do spread by that same mucous membrane droplet sort of spread uh, that this uh, spreads from. So we're very protected. We wipe things down a lot. We don't touch anything without gloves on it. So uh, you're, you're in a very safe place right now. Okay, great. <laughs> Let's take another question from one of our uh, viewers here. Uh, uh, Aggie wants to know, uh, do you have any tips for isolating if you have a family with young kids and seniors? Um, again, I think as much as possible, and it, and it seems challenging at first, but when you think about it, you can pull it off even in the household. All these things, don't share bath towels, uh, wipe down the doorknobs. If somebody's coughing or sneezing, uh, especially if it's a small kid, maybe they move into another room or something like that from grandma or grandpa, uh, you know, who's susceptible to, uh, to this disease. And if you practice those basic precautions, uh, they are pretty effective against uh, this thing uh, spreading. What about getting uh, outdoors, especially uh, on days that are nice? Now we're getting into spring. Mm -hmm. Good idea to be outside, away from people, or uh, I guess the six feet, the six foot rule still apply. Yeah, the six foot rule still applies. It's good to be outside. Uh, you know, obviously in the open air, um, you're not spreading anything around in the air, as if it's uh, in an enclosed airplane or the cruise ships. We all know those examples now. 
where the air keeps recirculating, but more importantly, people just come into contact with each other more there. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely safe to go outside as long as you're staying separated and uh, maintain this social distance like we are now. One of the things I know from the, uh, we'll get one more question here from Bruce. If you had COVID-19, can you get it again or do you build up an immunity to it? Uh, it's an interesting question and because it's such a new variant of the coronavirus, we don't actually know all the answers to those questions. If it behaves like other coronaviruses, they tend to come back seasonally. Uh, most people don't know this, but corona, other types of coronavirus cause about 10% of the common cold. And it mutates just enough each year, kind of like the flu, um, that if you get it once in a season, you probably won't get it again in the season because you now have antibodies and protection from that. But by the next time around, the next season, the surface of the virus has changed just enough to trick your immune system and uh, you can get infected again. Uh, but you will get some cross immunity year after year and that's how people as a society gradually build up uh, resistance as a population to any of the infections that commonly uh, come through. You know, when this first thing came out and there was talk about masks, a lot of the health officials said you don't need to wear a mask, that they don't really do too much. Mm. But now we're seeing more people saying you need to wear a mask, and we see more people wearing masks. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's another interesting question. It's a, it's a little hard to explain. So, it, so when I wear this mask, and actually when this, when this uh, viral outbreak occurred, uh, we started having all of our workers wear masks, and you'll see people around here even in the general setting. When I wear this mask, it's not for me to be protected from you. This is to protect you from me if I happen uh, okay. to get the infection. Because remember, I said it's droplet precaution. So right. if my droplets, when I sneeze or cough, get on your mucous membranes, that's how you'll get the disease. So the simplest protection I could do is to wear a mask, and then if I cough or sneeze, all of my droplets get captured right here, and you're at much, much, much less risk than you would be if I were coughing and sneezing directly on you. All right, thank you, Seth, for that question. Uh, you know, I think another question that, like, there was a lot of talk when this thing first started coming out, mm -hmm. and you guys wanted the approval to do semi-automated testing, mm -hmm. uh, automated testing. Just tell me, what is the difference between automated testing and, 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 and non-automated testing? So with uh, manual testing is probably what everybody thinks about when you think of a laboratory. It's, uh, it's, it's mad scientists with test tubes and we're individually measuring things and pouring things, you know, much like you cook in your kitchen at home um, to do those test results. The problem with it is I can't do a whole lot of test volume with that. It requires a bunch of my best techs in the lab um, to basically work all day long to get about 50 samples done. So we can do that about two times a day. That puts us up in a ballpark of 100 tests a day. With a semi-automated system, it's a cartridge-based system that we use, um, you can just put a patient sample into the cartridge. The cartridge looks like an old cassette tape, and you put it into the tape player. You can walk away from it for two hours. The answer comes out on the machine. It's hooked up to our computers. It's automated. So obviously, we can do many more samples like that because it requires less specialized tech time. Um, so with that platform, we can go up to hundreds a day, probably topping out at 800. And our newest platform is the fully automated, which is kind of like these big machines that you see in here. In the beginning of the day, we load it up with all the chemicals and reagents we need. We can put 120 samples at a time in there. In about two and a half hours, all 120 are done. We load another 120. That's the way we're really going to get the testing availability up to where it needs to be. Okay, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, you know, this is a relatively new lab. I mean, was this lab and labs like this built for like things like this for, for coronavirus, or is this just for every other everyday testing that goes on for? Uh, this, this is pretty much for everyday testing. There's over 40 hospitals that send us work here that they don't do in their hospital laboratories. In addition to that, there's hundreds of doctor's offices send us uh, tests to do. But in some ways, the way the lab is designed is set up to respond to these kind of crises. Everything's modular all these tables in here and uh, uh, instruments can be moved around on wheels. So if we have to rapidly expand, like we've been doing with the molecular section, we have that flexibility. We can do it right away. We don't have to do any construction or anything like that. I got one other question coming in. Am I at high risk if I had a re recent kidney transplant? One of our viewers wants to know. Uh, you're, you're at higher risk. I, I wouldn't say high risk, but you're at higher risk. Anyone who's had a transplant is generally on immunosuppressive drugs. Um, and the way uh, that you keep your body from rejecting uh, the transplanted organ you have is to suppress your immune system a little bit. 
and suppressing your immune system can make you more vulnerable to infections. So you're at higher risk than the general population and uh, you should be careful. But if you follow those same precautions that we're talking about, that should give you protection. Certainly um, talk to your physician if you have the slightest symptoms at all because they'll want to know about that. Okay, great. We're getting ready to wrap up here. Just a couple more questions. We're going to take one more from our viewer. I have one more question for you. So mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing right now is a bunch of people behind us doing tests. But this is pretty big. So what our viewers aren't seeing now is how big this lab is. Just give us a little idea of how big uh, this lab it really is. Uh, this lab is about 100,000 uh, square feet uh, in total size uh, for the actual lab analytic space. Um, you can't tell now, but when we came in here to first scope out this space to build the lab, and that, that goes back about seven years now. It takes a long time to plan one of these and build it. We were actually throwing a football around and punting the football, wow. and we couldn't hit one end to the other. Uh, this is almost uh, uh, two football fields from one wow. end to the other. So wow. uh, we're doing a lot in here, and we have a lot of flexibility, which allows us to respond to these situations pretty quickly. Wow. How many staff? Uh, we have about 3,000 uh, staff that rotate through the lab in all sorts of different areas. Wow. Uh, but that includes laboratory technicians and also a whole bunch of other jobs. Most people don't really know. We have about 70 vehicles on the road at any given time delivering specimens back and forth. We have computer programmers. We have just about any job you can name. We have it in the lab. Right, and we do see those lab vehicles out all the time. Uh, are those labs actually going to people's houses and doing tests in homes too? Is that we, we do have a service that we launched uh, uh, called LabFly, uh, where people can download an app, much like Uber, and uh, call one of our phlebotomists to uh, come to the house and uh, take a sample. Um, in addition to that, there's a lot of uh, patients uh, uh, that otherwise would have to live in a nursing home who can live at home, but they can't get out of their house. So if we need blood samples or other samples from them, we have a phlebotomy team that goes out and does a few hundred of those kind of deliveries every day to get the samples. Great, awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out thank to, uh, to uh, answer some of our questions and our viewer questions. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to northwell.edu forward slash prepared. For now, we're uh, at Northwell Labs. I'm Rob Hoyle, Dr. Brining. Thank you so much. Have thank a great you. day.